Uh, well, it's my pleasure to introduce the man on my left. I, to whom we are there, connected. Yeah, uh, there are many things to know about Michael Davison. Uh, one thing that's probably well known is that he's probably by far the most prolific uh, researcher in uh, the experimental analysis of behavior. Uh, he, uh, he got his, uh, he actually was born in England and uh, got his undergraduate training in England, but then he went to New Zealand for God knows what reason exactly, and uh, he got his graduate degree in New Zealand and then stayed there. Instead of going back to the Emerald Isle, no, to what is, what is England called? Blighty, Blighty, we'll say. Okay, Blighty. Blighty. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. Uh, he, uh, he then proceeded to spread the word. And his students now are, uh, I mean, in the perception at least of an American like me, uh, a, a sort of dominant uh, group in, in New Zealand. And uh, for sure, we owe to Michael the spread of behavior analysis throughout New Zealand. So that New Zealand is now you know, a big player in uh, behavior analysis. Uh, OK, well, all of that is pretty well known. What's, what you might not know about Michael is that he's a self-made man. This is sort of an interesting thing. For most of us, if you ask, you know, well, well, who was your mentor? You know, who was your supervisor? Who advised you? Uh, you know, we'll name someone who's a behavior analyst, and there's a, a regular sort of a lineage. But that's not true of Michael. Michael stumbled on behavior analysis in a book and, uh, and was actually persuaded by pictures and words, uh, printed words, and, uh, and then proceeded to do a dissertation, a, a behavior analytic dissertation on his own with virtually no other than perhaps, you know, emotional support. And, uh, and, and so he, he can't say that he has a mentor. Uh, instead, he has to say he created himself or something like that. Maybe he wouldn't say that, I don't know. But, uh, but anyway, Michael uh, has been doing this for a very long time now. And I know he's got some profound thoughts to share with us all. And so I'm going to stop and let him begin. Thank you kindly, Billy. <clears throat> it was actually Hilgard's theories of learning. There was a chapter on Skinner, his theory of learning. And that's what did it. Um, all these graphs, you know, reliable graphs. It just turned me completely on to behavior analysis. So I've never looked back since. Anyway, um, now I'm a little constrained here by the fact that I've got a lot of wires, um, and there's a mark over there beyond which I may not go. I'm wearing a shock collar. Um, <coughs> and uh, so I'm, if I look a little stunted here, it's, 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 it's for this. I like, to, um, I like to show this occasionally um, when I come to... Uh, the United States. Um, this is the world as we see it, you understand. Um, uh, and where I come from is this, this large thing right in the middle at the top here. And uh, where you are is this relatively small yellow thing um, down over here. Um, and uh, I make no apology for this because uh, originally maps were in fact drawn this way up. Um, it's only recently. Um, uh, that uh, people have turned it around the other way, which I think is a great shame. Um, north and south will change again one day, so uh, then we can change the whole thing. Um, just before I start, um, uh, I need to say thank you to quite a few people. I mean, first of all, thank you to Billy, because um, despite his introduction, um, Billy's a great friend of mine, and we've been working together now for some years on... Uh, 
joint research, which has informed, as you will see, uh, this talk. Um, I'd also like to say thank you to um, my, my PhD students, current PhD students, um, Jason Landon and Chris Craglow, too, um, and really to uh, a very large number of PhD and master's students uh, over the years. Um, now, my, my title is what reinforcers do to behavior. You notice it had a U in the behavior. I asked them to put that in just so I could read it. Um, <clears throat> and there's kind of two answers to this. Um, the first one is I have absolutely no idea at all, and then we can all sit down and go away and have a drink. Um, if you want the longer answer, um, it probably comes to the same thing in the end. Um, but we'll have to go through some, some tortuous little alleyways um, uh, to discover that we don't know a lot yet, but we're beginning to learn. So I'm going to be talking about reinforcers, and I'm going to be not interested in what they are, but what they do. And in, in this, of course, I'm following in rather illustrious footsteps, um, larger footsteps than I can, I can fill, I must say. Um, and we'll be concentrating, I suppose, um, pretty well all the way through on the, the, the quintessential reinforcer, the one we all use all the time, chocolate. Uh, sorry, food, I always get that wrong. The, the, the food is supposed to be the quintessential reinforcer. I think it's chocolate myself. Reinforcers exist in time and space. Um, and reinforcers have a location, they occur somewhere in space, and they have a rate and a distribution uh, in time. And I want to conceptualize it in this kind of way, that, that reinforcers drag behavior into that time and space. They are attractors. They pull behavior towards that particular time and space. So long as the time and space can be discriminated, they do attract behavior. But the discrimination, obviously, of the time and the space is, is a very important aspect of this, one that Tony Nevin and I have recently talked about. And if, if, if behavior does not actually enter that time and space um, effectively in some kind of way, um, then the attraction either is or becomes um, ineffective very quickly. Becomes ineffective means basically like the extinction of a conditioned reinforcer. If there's no longer a reinforcer there, um, the behavior gently disappears. So it's important um, for our understanding that the behavior um, be at the same time and space as the reinforcer, or at least close by. And I kind of conceptualize what I'm talking about in this kind of way. Um, I sort of got three attractors um, sitting in a, a two-dimensional space there, um, and the little dots by each of the attractors are supposed to sort of indicate really um, different rates of reinforcement that occurs um, at those particular attractors in space. I mean, you'll recognize immediately that we're talking sort of something a little like foraging here in a way. So when we're thinking about what these reinforcers do, what these attractors do, we're thinking about where the animal is in space in relation to um, these attractors. Um, and what we usually do, I suppose, um, and I guess I'm talking about concurrent schedules here. I said schedules, and notice. Um, I've been in the US for three months now. I've learned that one. Um, what we usually measure um, is something about um, a kind of conceptual location of where the animal is, in some sense, um, between these attractors. So we might measure a choice between two things or something like that. And the, 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 the average long-term choice might be there between these two. It might be there between these two. That's wrong. It should be over there between those two. Um, so things can be spread around um, in space in this kind of way. And we can measure a preference between these kinds of attractors. When we do research, though, we often try and just keep it in, in a relatively simple sort of thing. We, we, we set up two alternatives, two usually concurrent VI-VI schedules, um, and we 
Simply measure the preference between those two. Um, now, this one down here can be thought of as the context, if you like, the other thing that goes on in the situation. Um, and, well, we know full well that context has a great effect. But often, when we try to conceptualize it, we conceptualize it just in a very simple sort of way, a two alternative choice, um, and we often neglect the kind of, of, of context that's going on. So here we have two sources of reinforcement, one with a high rate, one with a lower rate, um, and the measure of preference might be there in, in some kind of sense. Now, just widening this out just a little bit, um, of course, the animal never is really, well, just occasionally at the point of preference, if you like, what we measure here. The animal is actually either here or here, or it's traveling between those two. So in fact, what our measure of preference is, is a measure which is the probability of finding the animal either here or here. And remember, there is traveling in here going on as well, which takes up time, which if I might just drop a slight incendiary device in here, it really means that measuring response allocation, behavior um, emitted rather than time spent responding, is going to be a better estimate of where the animal is rather than time allocation. So the whole sort of situation is that we can have one behavior um, many places at one time, which is a concurrent schedule. We can have one behavior, one place, and many times, which is when you're looking at temporal control over behavior. We can have many behaviors, one place, one time, which is response differentiation. And so generally, we have m behaviors, n places, t times. It's very, very complicated. Um, we are running in perhaps four dimensions here. And we know very, very little about any of these things, how reinforcers affect behavior under any of these conditions at the present time. Put this way, there is a huge amount to learn about what reinforcers do to behavior and how they grab behavior. One of the reasons for sort of thinking about it in this way um, is something that I've, I've always liked, um, Miller's conflict theory. Um, and that goes back to my undergraduate days as well. Um, some of you, I suppose it's, it's before most of your times really here, um, basically the situation is a runway situation where an animal um, runs to a goal which there, at which there is food, but at which there is also an electric shock. Um, and it goes trundling along the runway, let's do the bottom one, trundling along the runway here, and comes to a dead halt um, with all four paws smoking um, at this point, um, solidifies at that point, um, and that is, you know, in some kind of sense, a measure of what the fear is doing in this particular case. Let's, let's, I know it's, I don't want to use that word, but it doesn't matter. What the fear is doing in terms of repelling the behavior from here, and what the reinforcer that occurs here is doing in terms of pulling behavior through there. Um, some of the systems that, that Miller looked at and talked about um, are kind of super stable. Um, that is, um, it doesn't matter whether you sort of look down in a very fine level or look up at a, a, a quite a molar level, um, nothing changes. Um, this kind of situation, despite the fact that Miller talked about sort of oscillation occurring around here, is kind of a super stable thing. Um, in theory, you could leave the, the rat in there until it died and it wouldn't move. Um, then, the, of course, the, the, the data you get would be very stable once it's died. Um, avoidance, avoidance. When you have um, uh, punisher here, a punisher here in a runway is also uh, super stable. Um, but notice the constraints here. These are runway situations. Um, and the avoidance avoidance one, if you've got two um, punishers here um, and you've got a runway, you're constrained inside the runway. And the obvious thing is that uh, if you're not constrained in the runway, you're going to move out in some kind of trajectory away from the whole thing anyway. Um, now, approach, approach is really what I want to talk about here. 
um, just briefly at least, is, is kind of unstable um, in a trials procedure. That is, what happens if there's two reinforces one at each end of the alleyway here is that the animal simply disappears and down and eats one and that's it. Um, it absorbs. It doesn't uh, show a balance. Um, it doesn't show, if you like, a preference for being at, at any location along here. Um, the system we usually use um, to look at the effects of reinforcers on behavior is concurrent VOVI schedules. And on concurrent VOVI, Behavior, if you like, is dynamically stable. The animal moves backwards and forwards between the two alternatives. And if you then focus down on smaller and smaller time scales in this kind of situation, the concurrent VIVI situation, you end up with sort of maximal variance in the whole thing. The animal is either there or it's there, basically, or traveling. Forget the traveling. It's either there or there. And that's the sort of maximum variance that, that, that you get here. Now, the sort of approach that I want to take is um, using the idea of choice um, and seeing whether, in fact, this idea can be moved down um, to finer timescales than the timescales that we usually see in, in, in concurrent VIVI schedules. And I want to ask the question, to what extent can this measure, this choice measure, be moved down on a time scale and still work in some kind of sense and still give reasonable sorts of answers. There are two ways of doing this. Um, Billy in his talk to Squab um, was, was uh, talking more about uh, analyzing visit durations. I, I don't want to do that. I want to just simply use a choice measure. What we know about concurrent schedules, we've known for the last 40 years, I guess, or 30 in one case, that when you've got a system of attractors, when you've got, in this case, four attractors um, lined up, at least, lined up in, in, a, in a piece of space like that, um, that the animal will distribute its, its, the output of behavior um, between these attractors. So the probability of finding the animal at each one of these is, is, is given by uh, the strict matching law um, well, we thought it was given by the strict matching law, um, which you know, we've known since about 1961. Um, and what this simply says is that the, the animal distributes its behavior between the alternatives um, simply in proportion to the reinforcers it gets at the alternatives. And the reinforcers it gets is the important thing, of course, because, again, as I say, if the animal does not contact the time and the space of the reinforcer, it ceases to be effective. So it's not what's potentially there, it's what the animal actually gets. Now, Billy, um, 1974, um, generalized the matching law um, and uh, changed it to uh, a power function um, in which basically there's two parameters. There's a parameter called log C, which is just a bias parameter. It's a constant proportional preference for one alternative for one of the attractors over the other attractor. Um, and for our purposes here, we, we, that's not going to be terribly interesting. Um, the other one is the A parameter, which is called sensitivity to reinforcement. And it basically just says, uh, what is the relation between a unit change in a reinforcer ratio, log reinforcer ratio, um, and the change in behavior? And if it's less than one, the behavior changes less um, than the, 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 the reinforcers. Can we take this kind of relation and move it down to lower and lower levels and see the same sort of thing going on? Um, now, many people have tried um, to understand behavior at levels other than below the molar sort of level. Many people have tried to move down into the molecular and the momentary uh, to try to understand behavior. Um, and w with varying kinds of success, I must say. Um, I, I probably will upset people here. Um, but it doesn't seem to me quite to have uh, hit the spot. Now, Billy and I have been working on this um, in, in a collaboration now, which has been going on, I suppose, for about five years or something like that. Um, and we haven't got the whole thing licked yet. I must say. But we've tasted it. 
and it tastes good. And that's what I want to show you today. Um, the way in which we can understand the attraction of the reinforcer sources um, down at a much lower level. Um, we have one paper published in, in 2000. I think another one's coming out um, uh, in the, will come out in the March issue of JAD, I'll say, um, which I think is about to come out. Um, and we have uh, another one submitted, and there's a whole bunch of them on, on the front burner at the moment. Um, now, in order to look at what reinforcers do to behavior on a smaller time scale than the usual time scale, um, what we've had to do is to use a procedure um, which was introduced by Belke and Heyman in 1994. Um, it's a complicated procedure. Um, we'll just try and sort of get it straight. Those of you who are at Billy's talk at Squab um, will have seen this before, and I've talked about it before. What happens in this situation is this. In every session, there are canonically at least seven components. And the components are not signaled in any kind of way. The components last for a fixed number of reinforcers. We'll say 10, because that's what we've done very often. So there's 10 reinforcers in a component, and there's seven components, and each of these components is separated by a 10-second blackout. So if you want to be cognitive about this, the animals know that something is changing. What they don't know is what it's changing to, because the components occur in random order. Okay, completely random order. Once a session, so they will all occur once a session, but the ordering is completely random. There's no stimulus to tell the animal in the canonical procedure uh, what's going on. Now, each component has a different reinforcer ratio. Um, and in the one that I put up there, which is our sort of very baseline condition, the reinforcer ratios in components are 27 to 1, 9 to 1, 3 to 1, 1 to 1, 1 to 3, 1 to 9, 1 to 27. So there's a very wide range of reinforcer ratios in this procedure. Um, and um, it's going to be the animal's job to behave, if it can, differentially according to what component it's in. We're using concurrent VIVI -VI schedules, and we're using in this stuff a change of delay of two seconds. Billy, when he talked about it, uh, some stuff we were doing yesterday, was doing the stuff without change of delays. The, the nub of the whole thing is that we run a lot of sessions, and we analyze a lot of sessions. We run 50 sessions normally. We're going to increase that shortly. Um, and we analyze the last 35 sessions, and we analyze the time of every event that occurs in these sessions. So we have a lot of data. Um, and this is what is slightly different, I think, from some of the stuff that's gone on before. We have a lot of data. Just a sort of picture of it, if you like, of one particular session. Remember, the sequence of components is random. So it starts off with a 1 to 3 reinforcer ratio, goes on to a 1 to 1, goes on to a 27 to 1, and so on and so forth. Any questions about the procedure before I go on? Because we need to get that sort of straight. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's not quite like that. The ratio is 9 to 1. Okay? So in any particular 9 to 1 component, it may not get 9 and 1. It may get 3 and 7 even. Okay? Because it's, it's completely uh, concurrent VI, VI. Sometimes it'll get a lot more on one alternative. Sometimes it'll get a lot more on the others. But the ratio that we set is 9 to 1. Yep. So obviously in a 10 reinforcer component, we can't do 27 and 1. Yep. But by and large, in a 27 to 1 component, they get you know, 10 of one and none of the other. Sometimes they get one of the other. Any further questions? OK. So what happens when we analyze data at a much lower level than the normal sort of molar analysis? Um, and what I'm showing you here um, is a generalized matching analysis of what goes on in the situation. Um, what we're looking at here 
is the sensitivity to reinforcement as a function of the reinforcers in the component. I actually used a 12 here, 10 here, uh, 8, 6, and 4 here. Um, so these, are, these components change quite rapidly. Uh, these components change relatively slowly. If you're not comfortable with sensitivity to reinforcement, just, just think about um, how much effect the current reinforcers have. Um, so after no reinforcers, um, sensitivity is about zero. The animal can't allocate its behavior clearly because there's nothing uh, on which to allocate its behavior. After uh, one reinforcer, it starts allocating behavior to the component that is producing the reinforcers. Um, and up, up, up like this. These are not cumulative graphs, as Billy pointed out yesterday. These are simply the response rates between the reinforcers in the components. To get this, all we do is go across all seven components, fit a line to the log response and log reinforcer ratios, and obtain the sensitivity value. So what's happening here is that successive reinforcers are affecting behavior and pushing it towards the alternative that's providing the reinforcers. Um, and after, you know, perhaps about eight reinforcers, this has stabilized. The animals have come to a, a stable level of choice after just about eight reinforcers. This is very fast. In standard stable state concurrent VI-VI performance, it often takes, oh, 14, 15, 20 hours to stabilize the performance. But this stabilizes very fast. So, as you get more and more reinforcers in a component, so you get more and more an approximation to a stable sort of allocation of behavior. You get a sensitivity to reinforcement of around uh, by 0 0.5, 0 0.6, something like that, which is low from the stable state point of view, but it is stable. If you look over here, by the way, this is a higher reinforcer rate than this one. This one is... Uh, 2.2 reinforces a minute, this is 6 reinforces a minute. If you do it over here, it goes up faster and higher. Actually, I'm not sure it goes up faster. It certainly goes up higher. It ends up with a higher sensitivity. So, successive reinforcers in components are pushing behavior appropriately towards a sort of stable state generalized matching. And it's doing it very fast. The filled circles here are an analysis of the effects of the last component. Think of it this way. You do a generalized matching law fit, but the reinforcer ratio is not the one you're in now, but it's the one from the component before. And you can see, I think, that um, the effects of the previous component disappear out. Disappear out. Um, they get down towards zero. They don't actually get down to zero very often. That one might at the end there. So what happens here is behavior changes very fast um, and we get some carryover from previous components. Um, by the way, looking across here, as we've changed the number of reinforcers per component, there seems to be no effect. So the frequency of changing these components is not affecting how much a reinforcer does to behavior. Okay? That's true of the six as well up here. You can have graphs that look even nicer than that. In fact, much nicer than that. This is a graph of what happens at successive reinforcers, the response ratios of successive reinforcers in particular sequences. Um, for example, here we have a sequence of three left reinforcers. Now, again, these are not cumulative data. This is the measure of the response rate produced by the first reinforcer between that and the next one. This is the response rate produced by the second reinforcer between that and the next one, and so on and so forth. A sequence of left reinforcers moves behavior progressively onto the left alternative. So the probability of finding the animal at left here is, is increasing. Right does exactly the same thing, pushes it down towards the right. Now, as Billy pointed out yesterday, some of the most interesting things here are when reinforcers change location. So I get a left reinforcer followed by a right. You can see a large effect here. That effect of what we call a disconfirmation is very large. It's larger than getting another left one. 
That only puts it up a little bit. This knocks it down a lot. If you look at the higher reinforcer rates, you probably see it rather more clearly. Um, also, if you look at this, getting a right reinforcer and then a couple of lefts, well, you can see, even having started with a right reinforcer in the component, um, they are back down to, or up to, just about the same level of preference as if they just got left reinforcers very quickly, after about three or four reinforcers. So, reinforcers are having a very clear effect on the response rates that follow them. And it's a very, very reproducible effect now. We've seen probably hundreds of graphs like this now, and it's there all the time. It's hugely reproducible. Remember, though, 35 sessions of data. Okay. But this indicates, these data indicate generally, there's no real change in the what happens across here. Um, this one looks a bit thinner. It probably isn't. Um, uh, so changing the number of reinforcers per component is not having a great effect um, on the behavior change. Um, now, another way of asking about, well, what does the frequency of change of the environment do to the speed at which behavior changes? I mean, this is really what, what was informing Billy and my um, research right at the beginning here. It seems that the more frequently um, the environment changes, the more effect there is of reinforcement. Um, and we can say that simply by saying, well, um, in, in the molar standard stable state situation, we have to run for, for 15 hours to get stability. Um, in situations where we change reinforcer ratios every session, we have to wait about three sessions to get stability. So that's faster. In this, we have to wait seven, eight reinforcers to get stability, and that's even faster. So we expected, of course, that as we made things change more frequently, we would find that there was more effective reinforcement than there wasn't. There's another way of changing the frequency of change of the environment, which we've been looking at, and that is to play around with the duration of the blackout between the components. And here you see the open blackout durations of 1, 10, 30, and 120 seconds. These are all um, effects of reinforcers in the present component, and the ones on the right are here are all effects of the reinforcers of the previous component. The effects of reinforcers in the previous component um, drop out quite fast, and there's a lot of carryover with just a short blackout, but as you lengthen the blackout, the amount of carryover from the previous component decreases. There is not a lot of effect here of the blackout duration on what reinforcers do to behavior in this present component. And so we wondered about this because um, it seemed like the, the, the data from the state of state and so on all that um, was showing us that as you change behavior, well, the reinforcers more frequently, um, then behavior would change more rapidly itself. So um, Landon and I, Jason Landon and I, and this one is, is impressed this year, Jason Landon and I, um, instead of looking at the frequency of change of the environment to see if that uh, affected um, the, effect, the, the amount of change a reinforcer would produce, um, we looked at the amplitude of change of the environment to see whether that may be produced different effects of reinforcers. Um, now, in this experiment, um, in some conditions, um, all the components were just one-to-one -one reinforcer ratios, so there was no change in the reinforcer ratio across any of the components. Um, in other, so they, were, they were the standard, 27 to 1 through to 1 to 27, 27, 9, 3, 1, 3, 9, 27. Um, that's the standard baseline condition. Some here, well, here's one, 3.38 to 1 through to 1 to 1.1 1 to 3.38. Um, so that's a small change across the components. There's still seven different components, but the changes are much smaller between them. Um, 8 to 1 to 1 to 8. Uh, 15, 16 to 1 to 1 to 16, through to extinction, 
to one. Or if you'd like to think about it that way. Extinction on one alternative through to extinction on the other alternative. So there is a big change here across the components and a very small change here. This, the smallest one I've got here is the 1.5 to 1 because the way we analyze it, we can't actually analyze the 1 to 1 here. And you'll see, if you just compare simply that with that, that as you change the amplitude of the changes between the components, you get a huge change in what reinforcers do to behavior. Here, a sequence of re what reinforcers in a component doesn't do very much. The sensitivity gets up to about 0.3. Here, where there's one of the components has you know, all reinforcers on this, none on this, and you know, another one has all on this and none on this. Here, look at that. The sensitivity goes right up to 0.8. So, the, the range, I'll interpret it first as range. I don't want to keep interpreting it as range. The range of reinforcer ratios seems to have an effect. Look at these tree graphs and you'll see the same kind of thing. Here's the one-to-one -one graph here. We, we could put that in here. And you see a succession of left reinforcers doesn't do a great deal. A succession of right reinforcers doesn't do a great deal in the one-to-one. -one. But if you go to uh, the extinction condition out here, so there's, there's seven different components, remember, um, and the outside ones are extinction or extinction. Um, there is a huge effect. Here's a sequence of lefts, here's a sequence of rights. And you, you see, you go up there, you're increasing as you go. So, the, the larger the amplitude of changes, the bigger the effect. Can we go even more, even further down into the morass of data here and find out really what is happening on a smaller time scale. What we've got here is all this stuff averages response rates between reinforcers. Let's now look at what happens after each reinforcer. Response by response after each reinforcer. Um, perhaps you should ignore the stuff to the left here. The reinforcer comes here at zero and I've analyzed up to 40 responses um, following the reinforcer. Now, you can see, a reinforcer on the left produces what I like to think of as a pulse of preference to the left alternative. A reinforcer on the right produces a pulse of preference to the right alternative. And this is true here. We've got the successive reinforcers in a component. Um, you can see each time you get these pulses of preference. So there is a very, very local effect of a reinforcer, and it's, it's suddenly the behavior is attracted over there, and then it's coming back again. It's attracted over there, and then it's coming back again. These are falling off to, to zero, to no preference after a while. If you look down here, you see some things happening here. The, there's something moving apart here. Um, they don't come together like they do here. They stay apart. Um, and that seems to be an effect that um, is produced by a sequence of reinforcers. We'll come back to that in a minute. If we do the analysis by time, after reinforcement, we get the same pulses. Here they are, big pulse on the left alternative or big pulse on the right alternative, and here they are moving apart again. So we can see very clear pulses in preference occurring um, immediately after each reinforcer. And that's what a reinforcer does. It pulls behavior over there and then lets it go again. Pulls it over there, lets it go again. What happens if you get a sequence of same reinforcers? What does that do to the pulses? Yeah? Um, here's a single left, the first left. That'll be the first one in the component. The component then has two lefts, three lefts, four lefts, five lefts, six lefts. Okay, so you've got a run of left reinforcers. Each time you get a big pulse in preference and it falls off. Big pulse falls off, big pulse falls off. Um, the pulse is maybe getting bigger as you get more and more reinforcers in a sequence. Um, certainly what is happening here is where it goes down to after the pulse is moving up as well. So there's a short-term effect of the reinforcer pulling it over there, but there's also some residual effect. It doesn't go right the way back each time. If it's a sequence of reinforcers, it keeps on moving a little bit out. The sort of baseline moves a little bit out. I don't need to say it, but the same on the right key here. Um, the pulses and generally 
there's a kind of residual thing going on here. Um, by the way, um, I should say, um, these um, are difficult graphs because really that bit there goes across there. If we, I could squish these up. There are about 14 responses per reinforcer in this condition. If I squish them up to be 14 apart, then that will fit over there. So you can, you can then see it um, in, in a much clearer sort of way. Unfortunately, I seem to have lost that graph. Um, well, let's do the same kind of thing, just quickly, for um, Landon's data. Um, now, um, remember in Landon's data, um, there were some conditions in which there was a big amplitude change, some conditions where there was a small one. This is one of the bigger ones. It's the usual one, 27 to 1, through to 1 to 27, the standard one. And look at the pulses. Here we go. We start here. This is the first left reinforcer in, in a component. It has that effect. If there's another one, it has that effect. Another one, another one, another one, another one. I'm not showing the stuff before the reinforcer now just to clarify things. And you can see there is an effect of where it goes back down to after the pulse. Same on the right alternative. If you then look at the condition in which there is no amplitude change, it looks like that. You get the pulses. Oh, yes, you get the pulses. But look, they always come back together again. So it's something about the amplitude change which is probably causing um, this, this sort of intercept that's coming in here. I guess I, I, I should say that, I mean, the way we think about this is that um, reinforcers um, affect behavior in, in a number of different ways. Um, there's a very short-term effect, which we can model by a very short-term leaky integrator or something like that. Um, there's a middling term effect. There's got to be longer term effects as well. There's going to be, um, if you like, a whole bunch of, of accumulators which are going to accumulate the effects of a reinforcer, some of which will have a very, very long time course and some of which will have a very, very short time course. Um, it may be uh, leaky accumulators in, in parallel. It may be leaky accumulators which are cascaded in some kind of way um, on the lines of... Um, uh, 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 of what John stadden has been talking about recently. Um, but we can model it in this kind of way, and, and both of those sorts of models work very nicely. One thing I haven't been able, had time to talk to you about, is we've done this whole thing again with stimulus control. And that's been very informative. Because once you put in stimulus control, you're now signaling the components. Um, something interesting happens. The pulses, in preference, are attenuated a lot. Okay, so a reinforcer is not now pulling something over there. The pulses are attenuated, but the levels are doing the whole work. So the animal goes into a component, it sees whatever stimulus it might be, and the preference is already high, and it doesn't go much higher. What all this means is really that on concurrent schedules, um, a lot of what we see when we do a stable state analysis is the effects of pulses. It's the effects that occur just after reinforcers. But there is an effect of levels as well. There's pulses and levels. There's two things in concurrent schedule performance. Billy doesn't think about pulses. He thinks about visits. And what this means is after a reinforcer, there's a long visit. And then the animal goes back to short visits after that. So, what do these data mean? What, what, what can they tell us about behavior? Well, they, obviously, they're, they're desperately trying to tell us something. We're not actually sure what it's trying to tell us, but they're screaming at us. Um, but I think they tell us one or two things that, that may be useful in a practical sense. Um, what I suspect is that when you change the amplitude of changes in an environment, um, then you may well somehow weight the short-term accumulator over the longer-term accumulator. You may make it possible for an animal to learn quicker. What I think is this. If you have a very unstable environment, you can produce very fast changes in behavior, faster changes in behavior than if you had a stable environment. So if I was trying to change behavior, what I'd be wanting to do would be to put the behavior into a very unstable situation for a bit and then pick it up, reinforce it, and move it. 
And I think that would be the fastest way to do it. But once I'd done that, I'd want a stimulus controller. I'd want to produce a discriminative stimulus that, that held it there and made it immune, if you like, to pulses that would occur perhaps on other alternatives or something like that. And I think that that's, that's the kind of thing that a quantitative model, even a quantitative model of these data, will be telling us. This is the way to move behavior quickly. OK, I think that I've probably told you enough. I think that one day we'll be able to write something um, that is of practical use that comes out of, of these data. Um, I earnestly hope so. Um, but I also earnestly hope that one day Billy and I will actually understand what's going on here. Um, but there is a law um, called Davison's Law, which is this, that the more data you collect, the less you beep understand what's going on. Um, <clears throat> and there is that aspect about it. Um, but, well, who knows? That'll do. Thank you. Yes. Whoops, sorry. I can't move. That could be. The variation is proportional to the variation in the schedule to the staff, which suggests to me a need for a control condition. And that control condition would be components in which the ratio of the schedules does not change. Yep. So that you're going to have situations in which variation is punished. Mm -hmm. Yep. I think that's, that's a very good suggestion. Ah. Okay. The, 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 the suggestion is that the blackout um, becomes a discriminative stimulus which will control variation in behavior. Actually, it's, it's, it's not quite like that because what the blackout does, I mean, if, you, if you've sort of looked in detail, but the blackout progressively eliminates the control by what was going on before, the last component. It actually progressively eliminates. I'll draw it that way around for you. Um, it doesn't blat it out. It's not like a directed forgetting sort of thing. Um, and when it does, it goes down to zero in these experiments. Other ones that we've done um, where we have had asymmetrical ratios, um, it doesn't go down to zero. It goes down to a kind of molar level, right? Um, so, yes, it could be, but it looks like what the, the, the blackout is not, not a discriminative stimulus in the usual sense. It's, a, it's, it's forcing a process to occur, which takes a while, which puts behavior back down to a molar level. Um, whether it's producing variability, I don't know. Um, you could interpret it that way. I've seen it in interpretations of variation of you certainly could interpret it that way, and that's a, that's a very reasonable interpretation. And I think the, the control condition, well, we've actually run the control condition, in a sense. So we'll look at that. Yes? Frequency is the speed at which things change. Amplitude is the amount by which they change. Yeah? Yep. Yeah. Pulse, pulse. I'm using pulse in a purely descriptive sense to describe the change in behavior immediately after reinforcer. In other words, it, it, it moves and then it comes back. It moves and then it comes back. And I'm seeing that as a kind of a pulse. That's all. It's a very descriptive term. Yeah? It maps on absolutely. The question was, how does the, the, the pulse uh, idea map onto Billy's fix and sample? And it, it, as I say, it maps perfectly on. Because what you've got in, in Billy's analysis is a visit. And a visit is determined by the number of responses that the animal emits. So that's the length at which it goes there. Um, 
So, I mean, that is going to produce, if there's a, always a long visit to the alternative, there isn't always, there is, if there's usually a long visit to the alternative uh, on which reinforcement has just been obtained, then that will translate into my analysis as a big log ratio towards that. Okay. But that, that certainly does happen. But I think, by and large, it tends to stay on the side at which the reinforcer has been obtained. Right, Billy? Or even on the lean side. That's a progressive change. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you heard that, but there is, as you go through a component, the the lean side visit visits do get briefer um, and I guess get, get less likely. Um, yeah. But I mean, it's the same data. It has to map. They have to map. So, Ben, you... Well, th those first data showed what happens when you give 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. Um, and there was no difference. So basically, I think that there's probably not going to be a lot of difference. I mean, your, your question reminded me really to say this, that of course, when you change the reinforcer ratios, what you're doing is changing the number of runs of reinforcers on the alternatives. And I mean, Billy and I really think that that's probably the at the base of the whole thing. Not the amplitude, but the runs that you're producing. The runs of reinforcers on the left alternative, the runs of reinforcers on the right alternative. Yeah. Cut. <laughs>